I want us to start today by saying the Lord's Prayer. To me, it's one of the most important prayers in the entire Bible, and I want us to just say it together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. God bless you. You can be seated. I'm learning that that is a powerful prayer for many reasons, but one of the reasons is I'm finding out God is really smart and me not so much. Uh, because he knows, he said sometimes we pray, we pray a myth. We don't even know what we're praying about. Sometimes we may be so brokenhearted we pray and all we can utter is groanings. But his good Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes and takes our groanings and takes them to the Father and God can still answer them. And God is a God that loves us dearly. He loves us dearly, but sometimes his will is something other than our will. Does it make sense? We got a choice to make. We're going to be in control. We're going to let God be in control. And I've just found out, I've had those times in my life where I was in control and it don't go too good. So what I want in my life is God's control. And you know, I, I, I want to every day give God permission not to answer my prayers, <laughs> If they're not in his will. And because I just know that he knows more than I do. And so that's kind of, gonna, you're going to see that today in the, uh, the sermon. And uh, it's in, we're going to be looking at 2 Samuel, the 6th chapter. And they're going to put the words up here. And I want to just go through and uh, read a little bit of this to you. And, and tell you what's going on in this wonderful, powerful story about the ark of God being brought back to Jerusalem. As you know in the story, uh, the, the, in uh, Philippians, the Israel kind of got where they, they thought of the ark of God, the presence of God that sat on, in the ark up between the cherubims, the two angels looking down. In the ark of the covenant, you remember what was in that? The Ten Commandments. Some believe it was the broken commandments, but either way, it was the commandments and the children of Israel had managed to break all those commandments. It was uh, Aaron's rod that budded. It was the manna. And, you know, they, they couldn't trust God. They tried to keep their manna. And he said, just gather enough daily bread. And, uh, and God had more than one or two reasons to just wipe all those people out. Matter of fact, the scripture said, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But in spite of these people, his people, breaking all the commandments, disobeying God on numerous occasions, God kept giving them second chances. Not just one second chance, but many ch second chances and third chances and fourth chance. This is a story where God gives David, once again, another chance. And uh, so it's, a, it's an amazing story. Let's look at chapter 6. David again. <laughs> How many of that, that should be our daily prayer? Like, okay, it's Dennis again. He's done messed up again. <laughs> and that's kind of me. Uh, it's me again, Lord. <laughs> I've got a prayer that needs an answer, you know. Or it's like Chris Christopherson, why me, Lord? What have I ever done to deserve just one of the many things you've done, you know? But David, David again brought together out of Israel the chosen men, 30,000 in all. He sent out a word that he got a, he's got a project he wanted to do and he wanted all the able men to show up. He could speak of his leadership, 30,000 men showed up. David already had a, 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 a mighty army of 40 men. They were called, you know, David's mighty men. David's mighty men were unbelievable. They would have been the manly men. They were men's men. They were not sissy men. These were real men. Matter of fact, one of David's soldiers he one day yielded the sword so long in that day it said that the sword was kind of just glued to his hand. 
probably the blood and the dried blood. I don't know, one time I helped my dad put on a roof and we hammered all day. And at the end of the day, I had cramps in my hand and I had to pull my fingers like that to get the hammer out of my hand. I know some of you, if you ever laid floors or you've probably done that before. You just, you, you just keep going and you should quit. But the guy just kept going and kept going and kept going. Now, I don't consider myself the, one of the mighty men. I probably wouldn't be one of David's mighty men. But David had some mighty men. They had muscles. They had endurance. There was another one of David's mighty men that he took a, a spear and he had to hold off the enemy. And when they got back with the reinforcements, he had killed 300 men by himself and had them all piled up over there. And David goes, okay, we're going to have to rethink this. He's going to be our new head of the Mighty Men program. <laughs> and uh, it's true stories. You, you read of the Mighty Men. You know, David was no sissy man. David was a mighty man. He was the leader of the mighty men, you know. And David, Saul killed his thousands, or he had his men probably kill it. But the Bible said David had killed his tens of thousands. David was the one that when nobody else would go out, he went out and killed the, the giant alive. The amazing thing about this story that I love that you'll get to toward, we get it further in, is David became king and they had lost the Ark of the Covenant. As you know, the Philistines, during that, I began to tell you that story, the Philistines, uh, Israel had taken the Ark out there and like, look what we got. We got the Ark and you don't have it and we're, we're great. But yet they were not reverencing that Ark. They had brought the Ark out like it was a, a rabbit's foot or something. It was a lucky charm. And like, don't touch us. We've got the Ark of the Covenant. But they were not sacrificing the right way to the ark. They were not observing the ark. They were not doing the things that the ark, the ark represented the presence of God. They had these, the two angels looking down and the angels would have been looking down on the broken promises and the failures of Israel. Everything that was in that box spoke of their failures, their sins. And so the angels facing down, looking at that gold box and seeing it, there was a seed there and that seed is where the glory of God. Matter of fact, in the Old Testament, uh, in the tabernacle, there was this big old wall kind of made out of uh, skin and it was so tall. And when the scripture says that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, what it meant on the other side of that wall, the third part of the tabernacle was the holies of holies. Only people that could go in the Holy of Holy was a priest and it had to be at a prescribed time of the year and they had to do it exactly the way God said or they would be killed. Matter of fact, the priest wore a rope around himself and they had bells around the bottom of his, of his uh, garment. And so they would stand outside of the tabernacle and they would listen as long as they could hear the bells. They knew that the priest was making his way through the holies of holies and, and offering uh, sacrifices and all for their sins and doing the ceremony in the, in, the, uh, on, in the tabernacle. But if the priest did not go by the divine order of God, even the priest would be struck dead. And so the, the reason the priest had a rope tied around him, if he fell dead in the holies of holies, they would just drag him out of the whole tabernacle by that rope and ask, okay, who's up next? <laughs> oh, not me, not me. <laughs> but that was, the, that was the truth. God is a holy God. And uh, things have to be done the way God says. And he does that for a reason. And we're going to see that in, in the story today. But we see here that these mighty men, later in the story, these mighty men are leading. Uh, they normally would have gone out and done battles. And they were good. They could take on any nation with their battles, even though they become weary. David was anointed to be the king at about 12 years old. But he didn't get to be the king until he's about 30 years old. There's a lot of parallels to King David and, you know, there's a city we're going to this week called the city of David. And the greater, the greater David, the descendants of David, eventually became Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, David was a king, but Jesus Christ is the king of kings. He's the king of kings. 
of all kings. He is the last king. And uh, so this king of kings, and see, David, he was anointed to be king, but he didn't get to be king until at a later time when Saul died. Saul was the people's king. That was doing it their way. And so we kind of have that in our own life. We have a part of our life a lot of times. We know that we're children of God, but yeah, we're children of God, but we kind of want to do stuff our way. We want to serve God our way. We want to live for God our way. You know, it's all right to do it any old way. But we realize then when our prayers are not being answered, things are not going right in our life, we say, well, you know, what's wrong with this God? It may not be God. It may be us. We're not following God's real, his way. But later, when David was 30, he gets to be the king. Well, did you know that Jesus, when he was a little boy, they found him in the temple. And they said, we never, where did this little kid come from? He knows the scripture, it's inside and out. He's, he's confounding the wise. Well, then at his baptism, there's a big voice from heaven that said, this is my beloved son, whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. So they were all these markings, all these uh, different times, which was saying he's the one, he's the anointed one, he's the king. He's the Messiah. A lot of people think there's many ways to God. There's only one way to God, and it's Jesus. It's Jesus. That's it. None other. I don't mean to mess up people's beliefs about other religions, but there's only one, and that's Jesus. God ain't into religion, but he's into Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is the only one. But you know, Jesus is not ruling and reigning today on the earth. Jesus said there's going to be an appointed time. And at a point in time, Jesus said, I don't even know when that time is. He said that God's appointed time, that he would return, and then Jesus will rule and reign uninhibited. He'll rule. And it's not going to be any more battles. See, even if all the battles that David fought, how many knows if you kill 100, you've got 300 that hate you after that battle? Because you've got the grandfathers, the fathers, the brothers, sisters. Well, you kill my brother, I'm going to kill you. So every time David would have a battle, he had other people that was against him, had other nations. And David would become battle weary. Eventually, he was hiding out with the Philistines and didn't even want to fight no more. You know, I'm, I'm like, this fighting stuff's got to stop. It's not accomplishing a whole lot. How many of you today would say, in a different sense, you're kind of battle weary? I am. And David realized at some point in his life that it's not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit, saith the Lord. So the only way David could have a kingdom where there's lasting peace, he needed the presence of God back. And so the whole time, was Saul a bad man or was Saul just a man that never yielded to the presence of God? Because he never, Saul never even desired to get the, the ark back. He never even, he didn't rule with the ark of God, the presence of God. So one of the first things David did when he became the king, he said, hey, we got to get that ark and bring it home. Because when we had the ark with us, we were winning battles. When we were offering sacrifices and doing what God said, we were winners. Right now, folks, we're losers. How many could stand to have a little bit more winning in your life? I can. So we get in the story here. And David gets his mighty men. Now, these mighty men are now not just willing to fight, but you'll find that they're the leaders in the worship. A lot of times people think worship is for women. Let's let the women worship. You know, that's not a manly thing to lift your arms and worship. David gets his mighty men together, and the mighty men are leading the parade in the returning of the worship of God. I think that there's going to be another great move of God in the house of God. And I think the men are going to have to step up. I think the men, because men are going to have to say, devil, you can't have my house. You can't have my kids. You can't have my grandkids. How many women wouldn't mind seeing your husband get carried away in some worship? Now, you don't want to do like that mad cow, Macau, I said mad cow, Macau, David's wife, she got mad because David got into worship. 
But I don't think there's women, any women like this. I think there's some women in here who would love to see their women, that some women in here would love to see their husband leave the household. Not only leave the household with guns and uh, muscles, but they'd love to see their husbands leave the household spiritually. That they're the first to pray. They're the first to praise. They're the first to, ready to do battle. And they, they're not just willing to do physical battle. They're ready to do spiritual battle with the Lord. In the Lord against the enemy that's trying to attack their home and their family and their children and their city and their nation. Well, these mighty men, they all his men set out for Bala of Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called uh, by his name and the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned. See, God's enthroned between the cherubim that are on the ark. They set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadad, which was on the hill. I want to tell you something about this. I heard one minister say one time, what's, what's a cart? A cart is just some, a bunch of boards, a couple of boards, and a, two big, wheel, big wheels. Well, I know a lot of churches that have died because of some boards and some big wheels. The church will get together, and they go, well, that guy, that businessman over there in town... He got money. We need to put him on our board. And so we get a couple of big wheels. They can help us borrow money and they can help us pretty soon. They may be great at business, but they're not great at obeying God and following God. Could be. And so they get a few boards together. And that's why a lot of churches today, the pastor is no more than a hireling. He reports when they tell him to come and they, he, they do the bidding of a board and God never visits the place because it's out of the will of God. That's not God's will. I don't know that, but that was his take on it. But this, the cart was not in the will of God. There was no place in scripture where God says, put the ark of God on the cart. We know that the Philistines did it, but God never said do it. So David, David said, well, we, we're going to get a cart. We, not an old cart. We're going to get a new cart and we're going to put the ark of the covenant on it. Well, God didn't say to do that. Have you ever wanted to do something and your motive was right? You were sincere, but you were sincerely wrong. Sometimes us men, we are sincere and we're motivated, but we're just way off on, you know, maybe something your wife wants, but you're way off on what she really wants. You think she wants that, but she don't want it. But she knows you're sincere, but that ain't, that's sincerely not what I want. But I mean, we're like that. We tell, you know, I tell men, women in counseling and say, if you want something, tell the man, he'll never figure it out. <laughs> if you're just waiting for him to figure it out, you'd be off and just tell him what you want. Well, that's not romantic. Well, do you want it or you don't want it? And so sometimes we don't get it. And the same way with God, sometimes we don't get it. We want to kindly please God, but we don't know how to please God. And David, David, you've got to say, David was a good man. David was, he was trying to do the right thing. He was trying to bring the presence of God on, in the ark of God back to the people of God. And yet we find out God didn't want his ark carried around on a cart. God had already prescribed back in the Old Testament. In the law, he said that the priests, certain priests, the Levite, the Kohites, they were to carry it on their shoulders, had these poles that went through it and they were to carry it upon their shoulders and there was only four people. It didn't take 30,000 people to bring the ark. It took four people. And that ark, when they got to the Jordan River, the Jordan River opened up and they walked through on dry ground. You know, when they got to the water, the priest stepped their foot in and the water began to, you know, began to decrease and the water moved away. Well, that water had to be stopped way up up, up the river, river runs. So God had already stopped the river and by the time they stepped in, it was down and they could walk across. Many, many miracles were done because Israel had the presence of God and many, many battles were lost when they, Israel did not have the, the presence of God. And I think the same thing in our own life. If we don't get the presence of God, we're going to lose the battle. But David, like I said, David had a good heart. He wanted it, and he wanted to bring the ark back to God. So they set the ark on God on a new cart, and they brought it in from the house of Abinadad, which was on the hill. Uzzah of Ahio, not Ohio, Ahio, 
of the sons of Abinadad were guiding the new cart with the ark of God on it. And we find in this story that Ahio was walking in front of it and David and the whole house of Israel were celebrating. David was excited about this thing with all their might before the Lord with songs and with harps and lyres and, and tambourines and cisterns uh, uh, and cymbals. When they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the ox stumbled and the Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his uh, irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down and he died there beside the ark of God. I'm going to stop there and I know you got Bibles and you can finish that story. But when I got to that story and I knew I was supposed to preach this whole chapter, I couldn't get past that. I don't think it was uh, by happenstance that this story says this took place at the threshing floor. What is a threshing floor? A threshing floor is where when they bring the harvest in and they had these big heavy things, they'd run across it and it would crush and it would uh, make a break open where the seed, the harvest seed, the wheat would fall out. And then they would, they would be a wind come in and because it was there on top of the mountain and they'd lift up that and the wind would blow away the sh shaft and the harvest, the good would fall back down on the stone and they would gather that, that up. And it was the threshing floor. It was a place where they separate. In the Bible, there's a bunch of places talking about the threshing floor. In the book of Revelation, there's a bunch of places talking about the threshing floor. It's a place where the, you know, the sheep and the goats going to be, you know, your sheep, you're not. Or it's going to be the place where the wheat and tares are separated. Here's what I want to say that God, I feel like laid on my heart, is all of us, and I think there's a lot of us, wants to see the presence of God, the favor of God, come back into our households, our families, our churches, our nation. But here's the thing I've seen in this story. There's a threshing floor that we're all going to have to come to before we come back to the anointing and the presence of God. There is something, there's a lot of things attached to our life that shouldn't be attached to our life. Things we do, things we say, things we watch, things we participate in. God said, I ain't gonna bless that. I'm not gonna bless that. I love you, but I'm not gonna bless that. God does not have an obligation to bless our disobedience. He don't have no obligation to bless our disobedience. So David got mad at God because Uzzah fell dead. And then David's like, well, man, I did this for you, God. I done all this. I got this big parade. I got all the band, the parade's going on. I got all the high school and the junior high band. They're all playing. We got symbols going. We're having a good time. And the mighty men are worshiping. And you strike one of our people now? What kind of God is that? That's the kind of God that his holiness and his anointing is, can only be done his way. See, the mercy seat of God is, becomes the judgment seat if there's no blood on it. Because then the angels in heaven is looking down on broken promises and failures and, and disobedience. It's looking down on it and there's nothing that can be done to that but judgment. You break the Ten Commandments, there's judgment. He said, you'll surely die. There's judgment for us breaking the commandments of God. And we do. And there's judgment when we, God says, only get enough manna for today. You don't need to store it up. It's daily bread. You've got to trust me today and you've got to trust me tomorrow and you've got to trust me the next day. You're not going to pile it up in your tent because you don't have a God you can trust. Now, we're big in America and I, you know, I, I have a carry permit and I like my guns and I like my ammo. But I'm going to tell you, this nation may not be saved by guns and power because God said it's not by might nor by power but my spirit saith the Lord I'm going to keep my gun <laughs> but I'm going to pray for the presence of God and I say God if I'm not doing something according to your order the way you want it done Lord Lord, 
I want your will to be done. I want to get up every morning and say, God, bind my will to your will. My will's not important, but your will is. So David, he gets to that threshing floor and Uzzah dies. David gets mad at God and David said, well, I'm not even going to move the ark anymore. And it went down to Abinadad's, I think it was. It went down there and it just stayed there. And David went home and he's like, man, you know, you know, God, I was trying to do this thing for you. And like, where was you at? And, you know, the whole, it, it's just, you, that's a bummer, God. That was just a bummer. That just messed up the whole party. And David said, I'm just through. I'm through with it. For three months, David was mad at God. How many has ever been mad at God before? When he didn't answer your prayer. How many's looked back though after a long enough span of the time that God didn't answer your prayer, you look back again and say, thank you God for not answering that prayer. You know, that one guy wrote a song about it. Thank God for unanswered prayer. He saw the girl that he wanted in high school and he saw her about 20 years later and he's thinking, thank you God. I could have really messed up there, God. God knows more than we know. I don't know what God is doing in all of our life, but I guarantee you there's a threshing floor that I'm coming to and there's a threshing floor that you're coming to because God, the closer we get to his coming, the more God's going to separate us away from the things that are not good for us. He may separate you from relationships that are not good for you. He may separate your kids from relationships that's not good for them. He may separate you from a job that you just can't, you can't live the Christian life around. But if you're going to serve God and you want his favor and you want his presence, there is a threshing floor between you and the presence of God. Or that's what God's telling me. The other thing, after David pouted for three months, out of fellowship with God, God still loved David. He still had plans for David, but David for three months was out of fellowship with God. Nothing good was happening in David's life. But the, where he left the ark at, they were having the favor of God. God was blessing them. They go, hey, David, you know where you left the ark at? That, they're, having, they're having so many good things are happening down there. And David goes, well, I guess I do need that back. I mean, you know, I need to, we need to get the men. And so we read over here in Second Chronicles, the 15th chapter, we find the rest of the story. The rest of the story is David says, hey, you that are the heads of the Levite families. This is uh, 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 First Chronicles 15 and, uh, and 12. You are the heads of the Levite families. You and your fellow Levites are to consecrate yourself and bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel, to the place I have prepared for it. So David, he wanted, he got this idea. I think the reason that God didn't, maybe I need to build him a house. And he was going to build him a house. And then uh, David's uh, prophet come by, Nathan, and said, uh, talk to God. God don't want you to build him a house. Matter of fact, God said he never needed a house. God lived in tents. He's good with a tent. And you know, because there's a pattern of that, when Jesus comes and we find him in John's writing, it just, Jesus came and he tabernacled among us. Jesus was, Jesus was the Ark of the Covenant when he got here. Jesus was the place that the presence of God dwelt in him. And so uh, John said, Jesus come and he dwelt. The word dwelt there is in, the, in the Greek is tabernacle. Jesus come and tabernacled among us. Well, because of the cross of Jesus, we find out in the New Testament that where Uzzah could not touch the ark or he would drop dead, something happened by the time we get the New Testament and Jesus is walking through the city and he goes, oh, somebody touched me. Somebody touched me. And they said, he said, who touched me? And they go, well, Jesus, there's people all around you. It could have been anybody. No, he said, somebody touched me and the anointing went out of me. And they looked and there was a woman down and she had grabbed the hem of his garment. She had been sick for 18 years. Now, I'm telling you, time is short, folks, and the devil's mad and the devil's angry because he don't have much time left. How do we know that we're in the end time? Because of what's happening. But when he looked, the woman touched him. She didn't die, she got healed. All through the Old Testament, you couldn't touch a leopard because you'd get, the, what, you'd get the, 
bad that they had. Jesus could touch all the lepers he wanted. They'd get the good that he had. Yeah. See, when you speak the name of Jesus, Jesus said, hey, I want you to go out in the town. And he said, whoever you come, heal people that are sick, cast out demons and devils. How many believes there's demons and devils? Alive and well. These are two kind of people today. There's people that believes everything's a demon and a devil. That's not balance. Or there's people that don't believe there's a demon and devils at all. That's some kind of old uh, thing from the past. I'm telling you, there really is a devil. And there really are demons. There really are people that are demon possessed. And there are some sicknesses that come from the devil. Because Jesus come and there were some, this lady was all bent over and she was oppressed by the devil for a long period of time. And Jesus healed her. So he told the disciples, he said, you go out and go out two by two. And he they said, well, who are we? I mean, I mean, we're just supposed to go out and just heal people and, and cast out devils. And how are we going to do this? Jesus said, well, wherever you go, just tell them I sent you. <laughs> and just tell them, uh, I come in the name of Jesus and you sickness has got to leave and you demons got to leave. They come back and they were jumping up and down. Jesus, you'll never believe what happened. We went around and we told these demons and devils and sicknesses that we come in the name of Jesus and they just left. Jesus said, don't rejoice because demons and devils know who I am. Rejoice because your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But I'm telling you, the devil knows who Jesus is and he knows the power of that name, Jesus. Well, eventually David got over being mad and he went and he, here's the, the key. David said, okay, we didn't do this right way. The Levites are supposed to be carrying the ark on their shoulders. So he appointed the right Levites. Did you know right now in Jerusalem, when we get there, there the Jewish people really do believe that the kingdom of God is fixing to be set up. How do you know that? In Jerusalem, they've got the menorah in the city there and there's a big glass container or plexiglass over it and it's as big as a football goal. That's how big it is. It's really, really big. You can see it. It's already made and hung there and they've got a, a thing, a device they can pick it up with a crane. They're building the, the, the things for the temple right now and you can see it there in the town. Did you another thing? They've started doing DNA. They couldn't have done this probably 10 years ago but they've got DNA now. They know who are of the lineage of the Levite, the, the Kohites, if I can say it right. They know who's supposed to be ministering as priest and you know they got some things wrong but they are expecting for this kingdom of theirs to be set up. That place we're called is called the city of David. But you can go see this, all this stuff they've got built. Right up over the wall, the welling wall, the, there's a mosque there that the Muslims has, and it's right where the temple need to be. But they're already in negotiations at least once a year. Why can't they take a crane and lift all that stuff over there on the other side? And, and you know, what it is, there's like the Christians are there on that piece of property, and the, uh, the uh, Muslims are on that piece of property, and the Jewish people, and the, um, you know, all the people that at one time or another was over that property, the only way they know to kind of have peace, okay, you can have this spot of land, you can have this spot of land, we're all going to coexist here together and for now, that's how we're going to do it. And that's what you have in Jerusalem. You've got all these people right there together. And so the Jews are like, we've got as much right to that spot as you do. And so they want to just move the stuff over there. They won't have a building yet, but go ahead and have a service is in the talks. The other thing when the Muslims were in control at one time of that land, they took and walled up, poured concrete, and filled up the eastern gate. I mean, they poured it full of concrete. You can't go in or go out of that eastern gate. Why? Because the Bible says the king of kings and the Lord of lords is going to walk through the eastern gates into that city. What are they scared of? They're scared the devil knows that this is going to happen. He can't do nothing about it. Jesus is going to come back one day riding on a white horse and it's not going to be no battle. Some people say, well, the battle of armor God. No, Jesus is going to speak a word and all his enemies are going to be wiped out. Jesus, Jesus is, it's not a struggle. There will be no struggle when the mighty name of Jesus speaks. If he can speak the worlds in existence and hang the stars by the spoken word, you better believe he can, he can annihilate all the disobedient and ungodly antichrist people that are against him with one spoken word. And you're going to see that in the book of Revelation.
Not only did the Muslims seal up the eastern gate, that's the gate beautiful, you know, also, but they put a graveyard in front of it because like, y'all would never disturb our sacred graveyard. Well, Jesus got a cure for that. All you dead people, get up, get out of the way. I'm going through that. <laughs> I'm also the resurrection. So now there is no graveyard because dead people don't get to stay dead because I'm the resurrection. And everybody will face the judgment seat. See, the Ark of the Covenant, it's either the judgment seat. What makes it the judgment seat is when it don't have blood on it. You come and approach the presence of God and there's no blood on it. You're going to die. Even the priests were going to die. The sacrifice had to be offered the right way. But when they sprinkled blood on that, then the angels and God in heaven looked down and they didn't see the broken promises and the failures and the lies and the sin and the deceitfulness of us. They see the blood of Jesus. And just like the death angel would pass over those homes that have the blood applied to the doorposts, God goes, I know you ain't right, but you're right enough to, that you've applied the blood. I'm gonna pass on by. You're cleared. You're not cleared on your merit, but you're cleared on my son's merit. If my son's blood supplied to you, you're no longer a sinner, you're a saint. And folks, that's how important it was, and David learned that. So David was out of fellowship with God, so now this second attempt, David's doing it the right way. He's getting the Levites, he's carrying the ark on the poles, he's got the mighty men out, and they're worshiping God, and he's got uh, even a priest's robe on, and he's dancing, and his wife, Macau, or Macau, <laughs> she gets mad because he's dancing and worshiping God like he is. I wish, I re you know, they had a breakout of the judgment of God. I wish we'd have a breakout of the anointing of God where grown muscle men would dance in the presence of God so much that it embarrassed their wife. I don't know about Macau, but no place in scripture says that she was barren. But it said she never had any children. She said, I'm ashamed of you, David, dancing out there like, what kind of dignity is that? that the king be out there dancing half-dressed in front of the, the other slave girls. I'm telling you, when God, if you knew, if you knew in this service that the presence of God was gonna walk in this building and all your prayers were gonna be answered and your children were gonna be saved and the presence of God was coming back into your home and your fears are gonna be relieved and you're gonna have peace and you're gonna feel safety and you know the favor of God and you're, all your sicknesses are gonna be healed. Don't tell me you wouldn't dance before God. My Lord, I'd cut a jig. I would make a, you know the, the, the two-step or the, I play bluegrass some, they got some pretty good little crazy dances. I'm not good at it. But I believe if I saw Jesus coming, I could do it. I could do it. And I wouldn't care. David said, I wasn't dancing for you anyway. I was dancing for him. You know what happens in your life when you've got an audience of one? I've heard Bonnie say, we have some great uh, staff meetings. I've heard Bonnie say, she said, I, I, I can't help it. I, I get carried away up here sometimes. She goes, and she starts crying. We got a bunch of crybabies in our office, I'm telling you, <laughs> including me. But Bonnie goes, if you knew where God brought me from, if you knew where God brought me from, you'd have to be praising God too. Tell you what, if you could get a glimpse not only where God brought you from, if you could only get a glimpse of where God wants to take you to, you'd be dancing right now. Amen. And so David, he finally gets that ark back and puts it in the tent. David, good. we did it, God, we did it. <laughs> and David, the wars begin to end. The favor of God began to come on. Israel, they still had some battles. They just had some disobedience, but they had a God to go to. Just because we get saved don't mean we're not going to fail anymore, but we know where the tent is. Yeah. 
We know where the tabernacle is. We know where the presence is. We need to get back and flow to the presence. Say, God, I messed up this week. And God said, yeah, I know. And we come back into the presence of God. But David came back to the presence of God. And when he gets back, he goes out there and it says he went out and he sat in the tent for hours. And God, God takes David to the threshing floor. And David comes out of that tent like a brand new man. And I'm going to tell you about it. No, I'm not going to tell you about it. Teresa's going to tell you about it next week. It's one of my favorite parts of the, of the story. God does some work in David's life. How many would like for God to do some work in your life? I want them to come on out and we're going to get ready. We're fixing to take communion. Is there anybody who does not have a communion? Lift your hand. All right, we got some right here. Will somebody make sure we get communion to them? All right, just keep your hand up there. I'll tell you when to raise your hand again. I want you to leave that there for a second, guys. The threshing floor in the scripture is the place of separation, revelation, a place where the harvest was prepared by separating the grain from the use of the straw for the purpose of exposing and collecting the most valuable part. God wants to expose the bad parts of our life, not for condemnation purposes. He wants to do it for, to show the value of us. So here's the other thing. What issues in your life are God asking you to yield to the thr threshing floor? What area of your life needs to go to the threshing floor and be separated out of your life? It needs to be gone. And I guarantee you, if you'll listen to the Holy Spirit today, the Holy Spirit will point out to you some things in your life that needs to go to the threshing floor. And let the wind of the Spirit blow away the things in your life that shouldn't be there. Amen. And he will. The other thing is, do you despise the Lord's correction in your life? A lot of times when God corrects us, we despise it. God, we don't like that. I, I don't like to be corrected. I remember my dad, he'd say, son, you hear that bell go, pop, 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 pop. I knew that meant business. My dad's fixing to correct me. He said, son, I'm doing this because I love you. Well, it don't feel like it. <laughs> I look back now and I've been very thankful for the times my dad corrected me. They're going to put a verse up here and I want us to stand and read it together and I want you to let this be your prayer we're going to take communion sing a few songs and be done it says my son read it with me do not forget my teachings but keep my commands in your heart for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity let love and faithfulness never leave you bind them around your neck Write them on the tablets of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him, for he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruit of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim with, over with new wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline, and do not resent his rebuke, because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. If you love God... If you love God and you approve of him taking you to the threshing floor and you know it's for your good, tell God to do it, God. Separate the things in my life that shouldn't be there. Jesus told them when they took communion, he wanted them to never forget what communion represented. He said, this is my body which is broken for you. Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. But before we do it, we're going to pray. God, we pray today. God, as you show us things, you said that we shouldn't eat or drink unworthily. God, I pray that you would show us things in our life that's got to go. Show us some things in our life that need to be corrected. Show us some things in our life that's blocking the favor and the presence of God from coming upon us.
God, anything that would hinder your will and your way and your presence, God, we pray that you would remove it. And God, even at the time that you remove it, it may seem painful for a moment, but in time, we, in wisdom, would know that that's been removed because we're serving a loving God and he is trying to make us uh, a place for your, his presence to dwell in. God, prepare me, Lord, to be your sanctuary. Prepare me to be your sanctuary, oh Lord, I pray. And God, we thank you for this communion meal. We thank you for the bread. We thank you for the blood. That represents, this wine represents your blood that was shed for the remission of our sins. God, I thank you because the blood turns the judgment seat into the mercy seat. And God, I thank you for the, the blood of Jesus. God, you no longer see my failures, my broken commandments, but you see the loving sacrifice of your son and his blood. And we thank you, Lord, and we're appreciative in Jesus' name, amen. Now take and eat of his body. That's the body that was broken for you. That body took 39 stripes for your healing. If you need healing, I've seen more people healed in communion services than almost any other time. If you take advantage of the order of what God's doing, ask God to heal you or heal people in your family right now. Think of somebody, if you know somebody needs healing, speak their name to God during this communion service. His stripes paid for those healings. I'd like for you to take the wine. This is his blood. It was shed for you. It's the only way you can come in the presence of God. No, no man can be saved without the blood of Jesus. Let's take and drink. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, if you believe, he said, do this and remember to me. If you believe this is what helps usher in the presence of God to heal your bodies, save your families, I want you to sincerely worship God Sincerely worship God right now in these next couple of songs that they do. And the altar is going to be open. Our prayer team is going to be up here. If you need prayer, we're going to be here to pray for you. God bless you.